Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. We're good. We're good. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Um, I'm just going to do the people on uh, on the Zoom. So, um, Ms. Ferrante, the AEA rep, is she not yet? Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. I'm sorry, Ms. Key. Sorry. I'm <laughs> um, uh, and then we have some public comments. But I think so there, that's all that's online. Okay. We're in person mostly. Um, tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new session law extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of the Governor's March 12th, 2020 Executive Order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The Governor's Order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, it's being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interests of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And all of the members are in person this evening, so um, we do not have to take roll call votes for all of our votes this evening. Um, our, before we get started with our first agenda item, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, this is the last school committee meeting of the 21-22 school year. And I wanna say um, thank you and congratulations to Dr. Holman on completing her first uh, year in the Arlington Public Schools. I have a little small <laughs> token of our appreciation for, um, for a successful first year. So thank you. I was not expecting that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's been an amazing first year and I'm I, I did not have any words prepared. <laughs> so I'm, I don't have any at the moment besides to say um, it really has been an amazing year and I've gotten to know a lot about the Arlington community and I still have a whole lot to learn and I'm looking forward to that over the next several years. So I'm really grateful for all of your support and all of your support um, and the work of our students and for my incredible, incredible team because they really just go above and beyond every single day and um, support the work that we all want to do and that um, I've been really energized to do since I got here. So, so thank you. Thank you. All right, our first agenda item this evening is recognition of National History Day competition winners. And I will let Dr. Holman introduce them. All right, so always good to end the year with a little bit of celebration. <laughs> I have been absolutely enjoying um, all spring long, I think, uh, watching the progress of the National History Day students and the projects that they have been doing. And they have progressed from doing exceptionally well at local competitions to doing exceptionally well at state competitions to now doing exceptionally well at a national competition. So their teacher, Mr. Levy, is here to introduce them. And they're going to tell you a little bit about the amazing projects that they did um, for the nationals. And I'll turn it over to you. This past year, Audison Middle School had their most successful year ever at the national competition. History, National History Day is a year long competition where students research a topic of their choice based off the theme. This year was debate in diplomacy. And these students spend countless and endless hours researching and putting their projects together. And unlike a lot of districts who participate at Audison, it's a club. So this is all outside of school hours. Um, so now we'll hear from students why they decided to participate in History Day and why they picked their topics. So first will be Ruby and Sergio.
I think we mostly decided to do History Day because it sounded like an interesting and academic start to our middle school careers. The way we chose our topic was quite interesting. After looking at some of the example projects on the National History Day website, um, I saw one that particularly interested me about the AIDS crisis in New York. Um, and I thought that currently with the global pandemic going on, um, public health was an incredibly relevant issue. And I looked farther into that and I discovered um, all the diplomacy, which fit with the theme that surrounded the polio epidemic that went on during the Cold War. And if there's anything you want to add to that, I think that'd be great. Just one thing to add is the fact that it was mostly on a vaccine and how they work together to make a vaccine. And at the time, a polio vaccine had been crazy and new and everybody wanted to get it. Well, in the present day, we had people debating over the COVID vaccine. Our group chose to participate in the National History Day program because it allowed us the opportunity to explore our interests in history. In addition, we gained many valuable skills such as teamwork, website design, and presentation of information. This year's topic, our group decided to explore US-China relations because of the situation's volatility. And we decided to go back in history and see how it all began. Research into this subject led us to the topics of ping pong diplomacy and Henry Kissinger's subsequent visit to China. Well, um, we took a special interest in these topics um, because they were not born out of traditional diplomatic channels. Um, so for the 2021 through 2022 National History Day year, we chose the topic ping pong diplomacy. Sersha and Ruby, who did their did a documentary on polio, and they won the state affiliate award from Massachusetts, the first Audison group to win that at nationals. And Harry, Josh, and Ali got second place nationally for their website. Thank you very much to any committee members. Mr. Hainer. People often worry about the future. I don't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hanger, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, if you could point us to the website, I'd love to see this. I will send you. I will send you to the web, a link to the website and to the documentary, so you Great. can all see it. Great, love to see that. It's wonderful. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. It's really exciting to have students in person at a school mm -hmm. committee meeting again. Yay. So we appreciate you attending and congratulations to all of you. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to public participation. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. Um, I will be timing the speakers and give you a signal when you have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. Um, our first public comment this evening is Angela Christiana. Is she on our? Yes, okay. Good evening. Thank you to the Arlington School Committee administrators and others who are here this evening. My name is Angela Christiana and I reside at 82 Ridge Street. I'm here tonight to request that the school committee pass a secure storage notification resolution 
to raise awareness in our community to help keep children and teens safe from gun violence. The resolution has the support of Chief Flaherty, Director Bongiorno, and Superintendent Holman. I'm joined by my colleague who will also give public testimony tonight. We are volunteers with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, a nonpartisan grassroots organization that works to prevent gun violence in communities across the country, and we are Arlington residents and parents. We all know that there's a gun violence epidemic in the US, but we wanna share some information tonight to give a clear picture of how this affects our youth and something we can do to help keep them safer. According to CDC data, as of 2021, firearms are sadly now the leading cause of death for children and teens in the US, surpassing motor vehicle crashes and cancer. More than 1,800 children under the age of 18 are killed with guns every year, an average of five children every day. If we include statistics for 18 and 19 year olds, the number doubles. This includes homicide, suicide, and unintentional shootings. In addition to deaths, 6,000 children suffer gun injuries every year. Teens are particularly at risk for suicide and the rate among young people is at a record high. 10 to 24 year olds have the fastest growing firearm suicide rates of any age group. Firearm suicide makes up nearly half of suicides among young people. And over 80% of children who die by gun suicide use a gun accessible to them from their own home or that of a family member. When it comes to school shootings, 78% of perpetrators under the age of 18 obtain their guns from their home or the homes of relatives or friends where they were unsecured. We have all been horrified too many times by school shootings and Massachusetts and Arlington are not immune. We know that in the US, 4.6 million children live in homes with at least one loaded unlocked firearm. In 2020 and 21, there was an unprecedented surge in firearm sales, both nationally and in our state. The increase in firearm sales translate to an in, translates to an increased risk when firearms are not securely stored and kept out of the hands of children and teens. School districts can help to normalize the conversation around gun safety and add their important voice to other community advocates by actively educating parents and caregivers about how secure firearm storage can save lives. We encourage you to pass this common sense resolution for the safety of our schools and families. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Can we see, can we have speaker yeah, view going right. forward? Yeah. Okay. Can you switch <laughs> that one to just the speaker view? Mm -hmm. oh, the one that we're, the, the big one we're staring at is we don't need to see ourselves. Oh, yeah, we know what we look like. All, both of them then are terrible. I can't, I didn't even see <clears throat> her on the, the TV one. I think you want to see your face. So our next speaker. So Laura Gittleson will be our next public comment. So Laura, if you want to just come off mute and then. I think I'm off mute now, correct? Okay. You okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Gittleson and I live in precinct 17. I am the parent of a first grader and incoming kindergartner at the Pierce School. I am speaking tonight to urge the school committee to pass the safe storage resolution. There is no one solution to reducing gun violence, but there are many evidence-based solutions. Raising public awareness about the importance of secure firearm storage is one of these solutions. Secure storage practices are promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, national PTA and many other organizations, and they are codified in our Massachusetts state laws. I was so glad to recently learn of measures above and beyond those mandated by the Commonwealth that the Arlington Police Department takes to educate recipients of firearm licenses about their safe storage obligations. Asking our schools to do what they are best positioned to do, educate parents and caregivers is an important next step. Massachusetts has enacted strict safe storage laws, including measures addressing child access prevention. Massachusetts schools have already undertaken many measures to increase student safety, including informing their communities about threats and or relevant gun violence related issues and putting additional security in place if warranted. 
Some schools have implemented threat assessment programs, hardened physical infrastructure, adopted the Sandy Hook Promise Know the Signs programs, and or chosen to implement ALICE training. However, something simple is missing. Schools should also proactively inform their communities about the critical importance of secure firearm storage and current Massachusetts safe storage law. Schools care about and have a vested interest in all aspects of student safety. Raising awareness about the life-saving effects of secure firearm storage should be included in their safety messaging, just like messaging on substance abuse, internet safety, fire safety, and more. According to Everytown, over 2 million K-12 students nationwide now attend schools with firearm storage awareness policies in place. These policies demonstrate school districts' commitment to raising awareness about the life-saving effects of secure storage practices. Secure storage notification resolutions provide a framework for implementation, are proactive, evidence-based, entail no cost, promote a simple but wide-reaching message, empower the public, and do not create extra work for teachers. Moving forward with safe storage education through the schools is the first step in a broader community-wide effort where we hope to work with both Chief Flaherty and Director Bongiorno to further this message. The Plymouth School District was the first one in Massachusetts to adopt a secure storage notification resolution in May of 2021. Most recently, the Newburyport School District has adopted one as well. I urge the school committee to vote yes on the resolution and show that Arlington is the leader we all know it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen Turr was next. I don't know if she, she's not on. Okay. Um, Michelle Lambert. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, my name is Michelle Lambert. Um, and I live at 176 Brattle Street and I have two kids in the Arlington Public Schools. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I'm here tonight to speak in support of continuing the overnight science camp experience. Um, my daughter attended science camp two and a half years ago, right before the pandemic uh, shut down in her fifth grade year at Stratton. And she will tell you that it was her absolute favorite experience from all of her elementary school years. And as her parents, we saw this incredible leap forward in her self-confidence, her independence, and her connection to her peers after having this experience of spending several days and nights uh, away at overnight science camp. It truly has been one of the most valuable experiences that she has had so far in terms of her social connections and her emotional growth, as well as these memories that she's made with her peers um, for a lifetime. So as we're all very well aware, kids in all grades um, have missed out on so many opportunities um, over the past two and a half years. They've missed so many in-person opportunities to build connections with their peers. There have been so many missed field trips, in-classroom presentations, group projects, science fairs, school concerts, and school celebrations. Um, I think that Science Camp deserves a full study of the possibilities for continuing it in the future, despite the camp that Arlington Public Schools has gone to for a number of years, the Alton Jones Camp, now being closed permanently. Um, I wrote an email uh, to you a couple of weeks ago where I outlined some ideas and suggestions for alternative camps and for ways that we can continue this overnight camp experience while also addressing some of the challenges that existed prior. I, I know that there were a number of challenges, including a few financial equity, access for all children to be able to attend and staffing challenges. But I do believe that Arlington is a creative and dedicated community and that we can work to problem solve these challenges if the experience is important enough to us as a community. So I just wanted to point out also that there are no other experiences like this in any other years in the Arlington Public Schools that offer this opportunity for students across the district to attend an overnight multi-day immersive experience. There are other trips uh, that are available for like select sports groups or select music groups but nothing else like this that is open to all kids across the district. We have this opportunity right now um, 
that uh, that we can ensure something incredibly valuable and important to so many of the families across the district and make sure that it doesn't just fall by the wayside because of COVID. So I would ask that you give it a full and thorough study to identify some alternate camp options and determine ways that we can give this experience back to our kids for the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our next item are um, possible votes to approve a number of memorandums of agreement. Um, we'll start with AEA unit. Liz, yeah, is there, oh, I think there are people that signed. Oh, that signed up here. Yeah. Okay. A former member of the school committee, no, please. Will you show a little no. deference? You gotta show some respect. <laughs> My God. Yeah. So, I, I'm gonna let her speak, but I just I, we need to have a conversation okay. because our agenda right now says that people need to sign up regardless of whether it's in person or on Zoom by 12 o'clock with Miss Diggins. Oh, I didn't know that. So, um, so you want a motion to suspend the rules? <laughs> I, I second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? Okay. Just right. so no, no, you can no, have no, as long as you want. You. I guess I wasn't paying attention. You're testing I, um, my skills as the chair. <laughs> Finding the way we used to, you know. Yeah, it used to be there, just so. don't count anymore. Yeah, 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 I get that. Um, so uh, it's great to see everyone. Uh, it's, it's actually great to see the hybrid uh, meeting schedule and I look forward to talking to you guys about what, how that's been. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about something else. So I, um, something that I felt I couldn't bring to, to the school committee when my children were in school. Um, in my six years on the school committee, I had many parents come to me who were upset about a disciplinary action that was taken against, you know, to their kid. Um, sometimes it was about the consequence, uh, usually a suspension. And sometimes it was about language that was used or ways that things were framed. Um, what it left me with, and I obviously do not know the details of any of these cases, nor should I have ever, <laughs> you know, that's not, that wasn't something I should do. Um, but what it left me with is a feeling that I wasn't sure the purpose um, that was being given for these disciplinary actions. I, you know, I, did, I didn't get a sense of it. I, what I heard from the parents is a lot of use of, of the term restorative justice, um, but not connected to at least my understanding of that term. Um, and just sort of a, a, a real sense of, you know, so, so if, for example, a kid is, is uh, drugs or alcohol is involved, um, there's usually suspension and there's a question, so why is there suspension? What are we trying to do with that? What is, what is the goal of that? What is it doing for that individual kid? What is it doing for our community? Um, just sort of, again, not privy to the inner workings of either the administration decisions or the particulars of the cases, I just was never sure what the purpose of these disciplinary actions and whether there was sort of any sense of, of, of direction that things were going in. So I would urge the school committee, um, I would love for you guys to take this up to sort of look in greater detail about um, the kinds of suspensions, so the kinds of disciplinary actions that are being given to students and, and sort of really probe what, what the purpose is of those actions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for indulging. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, just to follow up, if, if you're doing, I'd like the chair to uh, find some way to communicate with the entire community about how this policy works mm -hmm. so we're not caught in a position like this again. Because we do have the sign up there at the door. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pardon. So he wrote the policy. You can change it as and okay. So it's not a no. This was a, not a policy of the school committee. Okay. That was language that he put in place. Okay. Um, and so it, well, actually with, I did. Or you did. Yeah. Okay. So with a hybrid meeting, um, I, I think it would be appropriate to go back to, to a spend, hybrid. Yeah. No, I've been thinking hybrid. about. It. Okay. Thank you for. Uh, it's oh, not. No. A no. No. It was her that wrote it. It's all right. Somebody wrote it. Or, but not, okay. It's not a policy. It doesn't. I mean, it it doesn't read to me that that you have to sign up in advance. Like it doesn't specify, it doesn't, it doesn't specify that if you're in person that you can't sign up. I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I as somebody who in, in many years decided to show up to a school committee meeting at about 6.05 when I was driving down Mass Ave and I thought, you know, they needed to, to hear my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just pulled over and, and came on up and wrote my name on the list. Um, I, I definitely want people to be able to show up and see in person. 
No, this, this is something that I was thinking about. So I, it's good to hear that it's not something that we have to put through policy. Okay. But it, I, I guess whatever way we go, make it clear to the community. That's all. All right. The demo ways. Um, so let's start with um, the AEA unit D, our paraprofessional unit. Um, so uh, Mr. Cardin and I worked on that uh, negotiating committee and um, Ms. Keyes, I understand that unit D ratified yep. that agreement. Um, and uh, so before before we take a motion, I just want to say thank you um, to Ms. Keyes and the other members of the negotiating committee for working with us. Um, we're very excited to have come to an agreement um, and continuing to support our paraprofessionals in the incredibly important work that they do for our students and for our schools. Anyone want Mr. Hayner? Move to approve the AEA Unity contract and authorize the chair to sign. Second. Motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman. Can, do I, I don't have to do a roll call for this. Well, any, any discussion? Oh, sorry, yes, thank you. Any discussion? I'll, I'll just, <laughs> Mr. I'll just, Carter. I'll just add my thanks to um, the negotiating committee um, uh, and uh, both the, the administrative team as well that was on that committee. Um, we were able to adjust the salaries of our lowest para, paraprofessionals significantly. So hopefully that will help us in the market. Uh, and also help our existing employees um, with inflation and everything that's going on. Um, but unfortunately, you know, as, as with, with inflation and everything going on, we also have a constrained budget. So we can't, can't quite do what everything we want to do, um, but we, we did strike a reasonable balance and I'm thankful for everyone. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, all in favor of approving the AEA unit D contract? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, it's unanimous. Um, the traffic supervisors, MOA. Um, somebody want to speak? Move to approve the traffic supervisors contract. And Mr. Design. Schlickman raised his hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, you know, I'm just trying to move things <laughs> along. Move to approve the traffic supervisors, MOA, and authorize the chair to sign on our behalf. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Schlickman? I mean, uh, I was involved in a couple of these negotiations and I, I just want to be thankful to the people who, not only on our side, who were really uh, resourceful. Mr. Mason is a genius with Excel spreadsheets. Mr. Spiegel's got a real great sense of how, working with the folks who work with us and there's a good relationship. It, this is a foundation of this, which made it all work. Plus the people who were on the other side of the table were just reasonable, thoughtful, uh, and we understood each other's position and it was a pleasure to work with them. I, we're blessed with some really great people in this district. Anybody else? All in favor of the traffic supervisor's contract? Aye. Uh, yes. yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, the bus drivers. Um, does anybody want to speak to Mr. Schlickman? <laughs> Uh, I move approval of the uh, MOA for the bus drivers and uh, authorize the chair to sign on our behalf. Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Well, we appreciate working um, with the bus drivers on that contract as well and appreciate Mr. Spiegel and Mr. Mason's work um, on that. Uh, all in favor of approving the contract aye. 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 opposed it's unanimous and um finally the triple a the administrative uh, no excuse me the um what is administrators administrators. administrators thank you um unit um which miss keys i'm that was also that hasn't okay no oh but it was a different group but it was about it Okay. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Just want to make, well, I want to make sure it was ratified before we, okay. Um, all right. Motion. Mr. Stigman. I move approval and authorize the chair to sign on our behalf. Second. Discussion. 
Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, I was on the comparable union side of the table uh, when I worked in Lowell. And it gives me even greater appreciation for the work our AAA folks do and the professionalism that they brought to the table. Uh, there was never a time when I didn't think that what they were looking to do was in the best interest of the kids in the district. Uh, real professional group. Anybody else? All right. All in favor of approving the AAA MOA? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Next, we have a professional development summary from Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much. So I want to preface that this report spans from last summer as we came out of the pandemic and um, spans this whole school year. So all the things that you'll see within this report will include just a high level view, some highlights of different things that were part of our curriculum planning and professional development, as well as some of the professional development we did when Dr. Holman came into the district uh, at our all administrative meetings. So as you can see here, just some of the objectives for what I'm gonna talk about, I kinda already uh, stated, highlights from the summer planning PD uh, from last summer and the PD completed throughout the year. And then I'll open it up for comments or questions. So, you know, again, looking at a high level view, uh, some of the objectives for our curriculum and instruction from last year coming out of the pandemic, pandemic was definitely to focus on developing a strong tier one universal instructional program for each content area, which included looking at assessments, uh, looking at digital and instructional resources that we adopted uh, for during the pandemic uh, in order to facilitate remote instruction and also to provide access for all of our students and updating various curriculum and instructional units based upon the experiences that we had during the pandemic, which included really narrowing down our focus and including those essential standards in each one of the content areas and understanding what students missed uh, during the pandemic and being able to make sure that we accounted for that as we move forward. So. I'm just gonna start off by each content area like, and, and pick one thing to highlight. Uh, looking at the digital learning and library, um, they created an updated uh, tutori tutorial decks for teachers, uh, especially around Pear Deck, which was a online resource that uh, teachers utilize uh, for remote instruction that they continued to use when they came back into um, in-person learning. Looking at the Google suite of apps that we have, we definitely maximize Google Classroom and introduce teachers who had never used it before during the pandemic. So we continued that type of tutorial. So again, teachers could utilize and access that uh, throughout the year. And then looking at Screencastify, which is another online tool that teachers adopted for online learning. Uh, looking at our uh, ELA and Ling English, uh, I just, you know, I don't want to be redundant and repeat this, but we did a lot of work around the early literacy, uh, adding uh, third, kindergarten and third grade foundations uh, curriculum, uh, provided PD on the use of uh, decodable text, and we updated the progress report to align with our uh, standards. Uh, looking at history and social studies, you know, made adjustments uh, to prepare for in-person learning. Uh, we piloted a fifth grade common assessment that looked at uh, the type of writing that is needed for students and uh, historical thinking. Um, you know, some of the other units that we updated at the high school, we added units on Afghanistan, Haiti, and Zimbabwe. And then to 10th grade U.S. History 1, we focused, added a unit uh, that focused on race in North America and indigenous history. So those are some of the curriculum updates that occurred. Uh, looking at math. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is that um, uh, Director Coleman worked with uh, special education staff to add a special education course on quantitative re uh, reasoning, which is a senior level uh, math course for sub-separate students. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, nursing, 
you know, again, coming out of the pandemic, they worked on COVID-19 recovery planning, as you could see throughout the year or experience throughout this past year, we had many of the updates to, you know, we updated the policies to make sure it was in line with what was happening. So looking at the masking and the testing, uh, the pool testing program, performing arts, uh, the artists of the month, uh, they updated those units to include uh, composers and music from diverse cultures, science. Uh, one thing I wanna highlight is that they created a unit at the, in seventh grade, uh, natural disasters and uh, director, uh, Dr. Hoyo worked with the ELL teacher in seventh grade to create that unit. And then um, I, I'm highlighting it there. And then visual arts, we continue to work on implementing the teaching for artistic for behavior format of instruction, which gives more choice and voice to students. Wellness, we updated our human growth and development curriculum to make it more inclusive, less binary. So thinking of the non-binary students we have in our uh, district um, in order to make sure that they were felt included. Um, and then world language, we provided curriculum for level one and level two uh, classes. Uh, moving toward highlights for the year, uh, as you see up there, all administrators, uh, we worked on certain topics and this was during our all administrative meetings, uh, working on building trust, developing instructional leadership teams at the building level. We just had a, uh, our last session that we were together, it was an all day experience where we had administrators, coaches, uh, teachers that were being recognized or had been recruited to be on these instructional leadership teams. We all convened and uh, we had a, a wonderful day that was led by Jill Berg, who is an expert or a consultant that we've been working with on in, uh, instructional leadership. And uh, we look forward to continue that work next year in implementing instructional leadership teams throughout the district so we can have that distributed uh, dis distributed leadership model so that we can include more teacher voice and also provide more, build more capacity at the building level for that, um, for, for um, you know, leadership experiences uh, for our teachers. Uh, and then we explore equitable teaching practices and the vehicle that we use to do that were our instructional rounds and learning walks. Uh, we had, we utilized various um, items or topics from the school improvement plans that the each one of the building principals worked to create and they presented to the school committee. And so the building principal really led that work where they identified something that they wanted the, each one of the administrators to focus on as we did our learning walk and then we would debrief afterwards. And then we would have the principal uh, talk about that. And those were very well received because it was a focus on instruction and it got us out to see the different buildings and what was going on in each one of the buildings and gave us a, a global perspective of of what was going on within the district. So um, I look forward to doing that again. Uh, we will continue that work uh, during our all administrative meetings next year and even expand it even more. And um, within my department, as we're going to have more learning walks between curriculum leaders and principals. Um, and then looking at the curriculum leaders, these are the meetings that I run. We focused on um, learning about the universal divine design for learning guidelines. We focused on social and emotional learning topics such as RULER, which is the secondary um, explicit curriculum that we're rolling out um, for grades six through 12. And then looking at the social and emotional learning indicator system, looking at the type of data that we can utilize from that particular assessment uh, in order to inform our instruction. And then, um, at the K-5 level, I would like to highlight that we piloted choice-based PD sessions, which was very, which were very well received from our teachers. Uh, during this time, the last, I think, four or five sessions uh, during the early release schedule, teachers got to choose from a, 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 li a, a list of different sessions that were led by our coaches and our director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we also had a, a session on digital learning tools and the teachers really uh, enjoyed that. We had feedback forms and they also suggested topics that we should explore going into next year. And we can use this information and this data in order to inform us as we go into next year because we have worked, uh, Dr. Holm and I have worked together to make sure that we can have a district-wide choice-based PD. So we will 
uh, look at the data that we collected for that and uh, inform how we're going to move forward, as well as like look at the different topics that teachers are interested in exploring as they and make it so that it's relevant to what they're doing every day within the classroom. Um, and then uh, looking at the uh, social emotional learning, uh, looking at second step, uh, the teachers were oriented and received training on implementing that as again that's an explicit uh, curriculum that we rolled out at the uh, elementary level, and we have to continue the training on implementing that resource. And then we worked on um, or provided opportunities for K through 12 staff to get trained in mental health first aid for youth and adults. And then looking at six through 12, uh, some of the uh, topics that were explored uh, this past year were equitable grading practices and heterogeneous courses as you as you can also remember that we had a study group uh, that included parents and teachers and you voted on us to have uh, to explore that pilot uh, for ninth grade English going into next year. So that work will continue this summer. Uh, Director Perry will have a one week where she will work with teachers, administrators in order to uh, explore different uh, pedagogy and uh, instructional practice in order to support that heterogeneous um, object objective. And then I'll open it up for questions and, and uh, comments. Questions and answers or questions and comments. Mr. Hainer. You did an awful lot of work. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for recognizing that. Mr. Card. Uh, thanks, yeah, thank you for all the hard work. Just two suggestions. One is, I know last fall was sort of chaos with reopening, but next fall, it would be great to do a report to the public in one of the superintendent's newsletters about all you accomplished. There's a lot of great work that you did that people aren't realizing it got done last summer. <laughs> okay. So it would be great to promote what you do um, fresh in the fall. Mm -hmm. after, after you, I'm, sure you're gonna, I'm sure you have a full plate for this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question, the second request is actually for the chair. Um, I was just looking up, um, so this, this presentation reminded me about Ruler and the new Celis tool and um, you know, my request to hear more about our K to 12 social emotional learning approach, but I saw that it's not on the agenda till next June. Thank so you. maybe we can find an earlier time to do that. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you. This is a lot um, that's going on. And um, as you were presenting, one of the things that I was thinking about was, um, you know, how many teachers are are participating if it's not during that that early release time and then when you talked about that and having it choice based um, I hope that that leads to sort of an increase in engagement and an increase in, in investment um, just knowing from the feedback from Dr. Holman's listening sessions around PD and T and our vision and mission statements and all of the strategic priorities just that interest in staff feeling uh, like the professional development is what they're looking for and relevant to them. And it, it sounds like from what you've shared that that's the direction that you're going. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. That is definitely the direction we're moving towards. Yep. Um, an update on K to five literacy working group. Also, Dr. Hickey. Yes. And I have a procedural question on this. Uh, as before, when I presented on our updates around our literacy program, I had to, and Mr. Cardin pointed out that I have to request to submit this to the school committee. Is, is, is this part of that or is this just, I give the report and then you make a motion to accept it because it is talking about a new curriculum resource. So is this part of this? I don't know if I'm confusing people, but I, procedurally, I just wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing. So I, I begin because it was well, well procedurally you know. it would be up to uh, up you can present and then it would be a motion to receive from one of us okay right. yeah but, but right. what I so sort of the long term picture because this is a process that you're going through right. um, is that during the next school year while you're <clears> um, <throat> exploring this more and making decisions the CIA committee would receive updates from you on the process and the feedback and 
making a decision and then could make a recommendation okay. to the full committee because Ms. Morgan yeah. does that. But we wouldn't, we don't need to adopt it until, like I'm assuming you don't have a proposal for us tonight. No, no. <laughs> right? So I didn't like, know if it was I feel like we would have gotten lots of indicators that that no, was No, you definitely would have. Right, I, so I didn't this know. is, this okay. feels to me like an excellent, like this is what's going to happen. Preview. Like, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. Okay, so um, this spring, we, uh, I worked with Dr. Holman, Ms. Elmer, and other, and uh, Ms. Perry, Director Perry of, of K-12 ELA in English, and we uh, put together a process um, in order to um, create a literacy core team, and we talked about it. We also included other administrators, so we spent a lot of time meeting and talking about this and planning, and so this is, this is a report that's going to show the progress that has occurred. Um, since we put created the team and it would also talk about the process of how we selected members for the literacy core team. And so we had uh, four meetings this spring. So um, the objectives for this um, presentation is to update on the work completed by the literacy core team. And it will uh, definitely cover the selection of the team, the meeting topics that were um, part of the each one of the agendas when we when we did meet, and we're going to talk about also next steps. And I reviewed, if we remember, in my last presentation on the literacy uh, program, we talked about, we presented a timeline of things that we wanted to accomplish and the milestones. And so we will definitely uh, review that as well. And then I will, I have a list of the team members that are also embedded in the slide deck. And then I'll open up for questions. So the selection process, the goal was to create a diverse team of members who have different levels of experience, knowledge, and roles in the district. So we wanted to make sure that we had a diversity of voice uh, and opinions. Um, applications were sent out to staff members and any staff member who was interested um, responded. We had a, a question that they, a couple of questions that they um, answered, and then we utilized that in order to review uh, who would be selected uh, for the core team. And the members include building and district administrators, coaches, classroom, EL, reading, and special education teachers. So the overall goal for the spring meetings was to create an agreed upon vision for an effective K-5 literacy program. So I, I wanna also emphasize that we're not just looking at adopting a core literacy resource, because we understand that that also we have to look at our instructional practice and make sure that it's updated and that we're using current resource, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> research in order to drive what we're doing within the classroom so we're able to uh, respond to the different needs of our students. So some of the essential questions that we posed going into this is what do we need to change? What do we need to keep? What is the data telling us? And what is the research we need to include in this process? <clears throat> and what process will we follow for assessing possible programs? So uh, the first meeting occurred on, on May 10th. Uh, I tried to make sure, uh, and I worked with, again, Ms. Elmer and um, Director Perry as we talked about what would be included as the agenda topics and what the objective for each meeting would be. And so you can just see here is a, you know, a couple of the highlights of, or these are the objectives or the, for each one of the meetings. Of course, uh, for the first meeting, we did some team building activities where people got to know each other. Um, and then we uh, also wanted to get perception data for what was going on, uh, for how people are viewing our current literacy program. So um, we had to establish a mission and purpose for why we were meeting and we view perspectives about our current leadership program. And so we also included, so we met as an all administrative group that included curriculum leaders, building principals, and we did a chalk talk. We talked about a lot of perceptions and we had various prompts that um, each one of those members um, responded to. We collected all those responses during the chalk talk, which is, a, which, a, which is an excellent protocol to make sure you are getting everybody's <laughs> voice. And then I replicated that activity with the literacy core team. And then we took all those responses and we narrowed them down to various themes uh, for each one of the prompts that we provided for the chalk talk. 
And so we were trying to, again, slowly come to a, a consensus of what are the things that we need to make sure that our next literacy core program has. Some of the examples like make sure it's evidence-based, make sure that it uh, provides a diversity of, um, of materials where our students can see themselves in the instructional materials, make sure that's promoting uh, a joy for reading and, and learning. Um, and so, and also providing direction for teachers on how to uh, implement the program. So we had that, we, and so that was the purpose for that meeting. And we came out of it, you know, with some things that we know that we needed to include as we went forward to select our next literacy core program. And then on May 17th, we met again. And we uh, also want to uh, indicate that we uh, partner and are now partnering with the Hill for Literacy. Uh, who also works with the state um, and the executive director is um, working directly with the executive director, Darcy Burns. And um, I recruited her to come in and to give us all the members because not every member on that literacy core team is a literacy teacher. So they are coming from different backgrounds. So we wanted to have a, some understanding of what the science of reading is. So she came in and provided an uh, overview of what the science of reading is and how it, um, how we need, and how we can include those principles into our instruction, uh, and then uh, we had our kindergarten through second grade um, literacy coaches present to the team, so they can give an overview of all the things, all the updates that we've done, um, so they can understand where we're starting from. So uh, that went very well, and uh, so now we're still shape, we're shaping a picture of what our literacy program, where we are right now and what we need to do to move forward. And so on June 7th, we met again. Um, the meeting objective this time was to provide uh, fourth and fifth grade updates and we had our literacy coach present. And then we delved into some of the data that we've collected um, throughout the past year, which included our MCAS data. So we looked at um, district data, we looked at um, item analysis, and you know, we broke up into various groups. And so one group uh, had kindergarten <coughs> through first grade, another group had, um, we didn't have any, to be honest with you, we didn't have the second grade data because that was our Dibbles. We had to add the subtests to our Dibbles uh, assessments in order to get a composite score. So we now have that going into the uh, summer and I'm going to be able to analyze all of that Dibbles data over the summer. Um, so we didn't have the second grade data that we wanted at that time, but we had third, fourth, and fifth. We used the MCAS, we did an item analysis, we broke into separate groups, and each one of the teams um, used a protocol to, to review the data. So, you know, looking at the perception data, understanding what we need to include, and then looking at where we are and how our students are currently performing. So again, we're shaping that picture. Everybody's getting an understanding of what we need to do and what we need to focus on moving forward. And so on June 16th, we met again, and this was our last meeting for the year. Um, and we had, again, I called in, um, recruited Darcy Burns, the executive director of Hill for Literacy. And she came in and gave an overview of what the process includes in order to um, assess various literacy programs. And it's quite an undertaking. And she uh, um, shared a couple of models that we could um, utilize. And I've already you know, uh, come to Dr. Holman to talk about what model I would like to use, which, in, which is including all of our uh, teachers and personnel and parents to have an opportunity to review the literacy programs. And we would narrow it down over the summer to maybe three or four. And so, and we also create a timeline for what that's gonna look like uh, for the, probably from September to February, the process will take in order for everyone to have an opportunity to, to review the literacy programs that we're, um, that we're thinking about. And I can get more into the details of what that process looks like in September um, as we uh, unveil the timeline. We can also present the, the finalists, if you will, the three or four literacy programs that we're gonna consider. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Elmer if she wants to add anything um, to anything I've just said, uh, because she's been a thought partner or, as well as Director Perry. Did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I, did. I think that folks are excited to engage in this work. I think having a representative group of both special educators, general educators, um, other content area leaders, so not just um, ELA, but our science director and those team members is going to make for a well-rounded process. And um, we look forward to community engagement in the process as well. And yeah, we look forward to 
it's certainly something our department has been eager to engage in. So Absolutely. We're happy. Um, so going back and reviewing the timeline, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Um, we are ready to start reviewing various uh, programs in September, and our goal for me is to meet with uh, Ms. Burns and excuse me, Ms. Elmer and Ms. Perry over the summer so that we can develop that timeline and we can start to narrow down the, the list of programs that we want to review down to three or four so we can hit the ground running um, in September. So, um, and I'll, I'll just show here that there might be a slight adjustment there as it relates to the review of different programs. And like I said, it, it, it probably is gonna go from September to February. And then we will also, oh, I also wanna say state that we're gonna intertwine you know, the more science of reading PD and really look uh, again, intertwining the professional development that teachers will need in order to implement the literacy program because we wanna make sure that when we come out of this, we are all on the same page as what is best practice, what we need to do and, and what is the best way to do the implementation. So we'll be looking at scheduling, looking at the, our literacy blocks and see what needs to be adjusted to make sure that we're focusing on all the right things and, and we have all the components uh, ready to go once we adopt the new literacy program. And then we'll also talk about the implementation of it, like what grades we're gonna start with, cause we won't be, we won't be able to do this K through five. We'll have to start in, in various components. So we'll maybe start with grades four and five because we already done a lot of work around the early literacy. And by then teachers will probably be very well versed in all the things that we've already introduced and we'll be ready to go, um, you know, kindergarten through third grade. And then we'll we'll parse it out to make sure that it's uh, that it that we're doing this very strategic and that uh, teachers are able to um, it, they won't feel overwhelmed. And then this is the last couple of slides of just who's on the literacy core team. And as you can see, it's a diverse uh, it's an array of different people from different um, roles, uh, so they have different perspectives. So I will now open it up for questions. Mr. Hainer. I'd like to commend you and the team, Dr. Holman, for having not only literacy people, but special education and ELL programs I've seen in the past don't include them. And the program that accepted has to be adjusted or developed or those, those constituents end up having to fit in and it doesn't always work. So I applaud you for doing that up front and getting it done the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to add to, to that point. At our last meeting, we also had our ELL director and the ELL teacher that's on our literacy core team. They also gave a presentation mm -hmm. as to what our ELL students need so that we can take that in consideration as we're selecting the next um, literacy core program. Ms. Morgan. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the team, I, I, I know that you gave us the team and it sounds like you've collected applications. For me, it, it, it feels pretty ad, administrator heavy as a group. Just, I would have thought, I would have expected more K3 probably gen ed teachers. Um, so I'm just curious, was it just that they didn't apply or like, I guess I, without being specific, obviously, um, like did, I guess what sort of percentage of applicants ended up being Put on this. I would have to go back and we really look at the spreadsheet because we, we created a spreadsheet for all the people that did apply. But I will say this, I wanted to make sure that we had, you know, maybe one or two people from each area and that we did have early elementary, we had upper elementary and that all of the buildings were represented. So and again, it is based upon who applied as well. So, um, you know, this, again, was a very tough year for some teachers. Mm -hmm. And you know, coming out of the pandemic, we were st still in a pandemic, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's based upon who applied and then how we felt. And, and we also wanted to make sure that the team wasn't too big. We wanted to make sure it was manageable. So all those considerations went into um, evaluating and assessing who applied, their answers, and, you know, making sure that we had a, a, a diversity of different you know, roles and experiences. So that's that's probably the best way I can repeat right, I mean, not repeat, but say right now about the process. Okay. Um, but I would have to go back and look at the spreadsheet in order to do the percentages of who actually applied. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shelton. 
Okay, your On the Horizon it indicates that fall 2023 would be full implementation. Feels ambitious, so you, there's really going to be a lot of intense. Did you say fall 2023? Uh, fall 2023, it says full, full implementation, fall 2023. And that red box in the On the Horizon. That's an adjustment we would make. Yeah. So it was on the old graphic. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Right. We will, yes, we're going to make it. We're going to make it slow. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, that felt ambitious. Right. Um, right. Uh, my only other question is, I, I guess we don't know where we're going with this and what kind of program we, which program we'd be choosing. But uh, I'm, I'm anticipating a difficult year. So if we, if we are apprised as we're going along of what, budgetary implementations might be uh, before us because an implementation of a new program usually involves buying a bunch of new material as well. Right, that definitely will be taken in consideration. I've already had a conversation with uh, Darcy Burns. The reason why I did select the Hill for Literacy is because they've done this with other districts mm -hmm. and they've done this and they've helped. They've also like looked at the different rubrics that you use in order to evaluate and assess a literacy program and they've made adjustments mm -hmm. and they've mm -hmm. looked at various ones and they've combined and made their own so mm -hmm. they've taken you know and they've uh, taken in consideration teacher feedback mm -hmm. that they've received when they've done this in the past so i think that uh, one of the things that she did mention is that most of the literacy programs are around the same price point mm -hmm. so i could come to dr holman as we narrow it down to three or four and say mm -hmm here's an average of what the cost may be mm -hmm. so that we can consider that. And so I don't, I don't give Mr. Mason a hard sack mm -hmm. as we start to talk about uh, future budgeting um, uh, things that we'll need, resources that we'll need for our instruction. Hey, you've sat with us through all these budget things Absolutely. anyway. So you know what our schedule is. Absolutely. And uh, so that's but, why I would be able to come to the school committee and um, first to Dr. Holman and say, here's an average of what it mm -hmm. might include, which may mm -hmm. some variance in cost depending mm -hmm. on what we finally land on in February. But I think that we would have a good idea. It wouldn't be, you know, such a dramatic change if we were to suggest one and from the average that we're able to put together from the three or four that we select for. Yeah, as long as we're doing the right thing and we know what the impact is going to be at the Right. That, that seems reasonable. But, and also, uh, well, like I said before, we, like, we're not going to do all at once. Mm -hmm. So we'll maybe do grades four and five. And so you buy the resources, mm -hmm. get those implemented, and then move on and, and look at the other grades and then purchase the materials as you, move, as you go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. But just to return to, to presentation, we had four administrators of the 24 people who are on that team. Um, and we had 12 folks who were not accepted into the group who had applied. Um, we really had tried to cap it at 20 and then we ended up at adding a few more in. Uh, there were a lot of coaches on there. That's at least in part because they have to help us roll it out um, and have been sort of at the center of a lot of our conversations around this. So a lot of the literacy, we, we included I think almost all the literacy coaches who Applied, we did. We did. Uh, but we're also really trying to make sure that we represented some of the constituents on the outer, out, you know, in outer roles to support the kids. We did um, also not include some EL teachers, reading specialists, um, and a few classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I just want to emphasize the process that we're that I'm leaning towards that I have presented to Dr. Holman includes everybody mm -hmm. so you you know it includes setting up vertical teams at each school and so we would go to that publisher the different publishers who make the final list of three or four and we'd get those materials we'd set it up in a an area in the room and then we would go to the principals and they would create vertical teams and so every teacher would have an opportunity to use the ru rubric that we're going to use to evaluate the literacy program and then we would collect we would do different rounds so we would do one round with one resource collect the data and then the steering team would collect the data and be able to look to see and look at the scoring of it and understand like how each one of the resources you know is faring against each other and matching the rubric and the things that we know that we need to include as we move forward the things that we're going over right now say we want to make sure that it has this and so 
every teacher in this particular model would be included and have an opportunity to assess the literacy core program that we would eventually select for the district. No, that's really helpful. As somebody, I, I do a lot of learning resource selection as part mm -hmm. of my job. And I know that the hardest thing is at the end of the day, none of them are actually what you really, really like they're, they're all like, you know, they're, they're all various shades of like, good to mm -hmm. acceptable and and the hardest thing at the end of the day is to make that decision where you're like well this gives me like a lot of what i want um right. so i i i am very empathetic um but the mm -hmm. process sounds sounds good so thank right you. so the, the literacy core team really works as a steering committee right and not necessarily um it, exclusive a selection committee exactly um i uh, shared some of similar concerns just about the mm -hmm. representation of classroom general education classroom teachers on the steering committee just in the sense that this is looking for a, a core curriculum mm -hmm. that general education teachers are going to be expected to Correct. deliver um, I do feel better about it hearing that it will be presented to every um, to everyone which leads me to um, just add that I um, continue to appreciate the weekly um, early dismissal time for teachers to have these kinds of opportunities because um, when these things happen after school, even you know with a workshop rate, um, there's less. You know, you don't get every single teacher participating, and so when it's built into when the professional development um, is built into the day, uh, you get. Um, input from everybody. So I just wanted to add that as a, a, a benefit for our schedule too. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to move on to our second read and um, possible vote to approve the vision, vision, mission statement, vision statement, um, and some strategic priorities. I don't know if Dr. Hammond or Ms. Tucker. I'm excited to be able to share what I think is a final version of a new vision, mission, and four new strategic priorities for the district. This is the foundation of what will become a five-year strategic plan. Um, and I'm so grateful to the community members who helped us um, come up with initial drafts of these and to the school committee for helping us get them to where they are at now through a lot of really rich conversation. So with no further ado, uh, just a quick reminder on timeline that right now we're at June 2022, right where we were hoping we would be finalizing vision and mission statements, um, possibly strategic priorities was on the timeline and I'm hopeful that we'll, it won't be just possibly tonight. Um, and then over the summer, we're going to have an into the fall, have some community dialogues to start unpacking and processing the final statements. Uh, we are slated to start doing that with the administrative team on Monday of next week. Um, we will start drafting some action steps um, and then in the fall and into, um, into the winter, we will establish a process for drafting and gathering feedback on the five-year action steps and hope for final approval and beginning implementation of the strategic plan in January. <clears throat> so I'm going to read through these statements because I think they're worth hearing out loud. So our new vision statement, if the school committee approves it, would be that the vision of the Arlington Public Schools is to be an equitable educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth and joy, and are empowered to shape their own futures and contribute to a better world. Our new mission statement would be that the Arlington Public Schools focuses on the whole child to create inclusive and innovative learning opportunities for all students, values diverse identities and ways of learning, prepares all staff to maintain high expectations while providing necessary supports and sustains collaborative partnerships with families and the community. <coughs> Strategic priority one is focused on ensuring equity and excellence. And it reads that the Arlington Public Schools will ensure equity, excellence, and access to rigorous learning experiences for all students. All graduates will be prepared to achieve their choices of post-secondary education, career, and community contribution. 
Strategic Priority 2 is focused on valuing all staff. It reads that the Arlington Public Schools will recruit and retain an excellent and diverse workforce by creating a collaborative and supportive culture for all staff, providing high quality and relevant professional development, expanding opportunities for leadership and shared decision making, and prioritizing representation, diverse perspectives, and expertise. Strategic priority three is focused on improving infrastructure operations and sustainability. It reads that the Arlington Public Schools will maintain a system of schools that is safe while maintained sustainable and fiscally responsible with the appropriate tools and resources to support best <coughs> educational practices and an optimum teaching and learning environment. And strategic priority four is focused on sustaining collaborative partnerships. It reads that the Arlington Public Schools will partner collaboratively with families in meeting the educational needs of all students, facilitate consistent two-way communication, and provide timely, transparent, relevant, and accessible information to all stakeholders. And that's all. Unless the committee feels differently, we can take this all as one. Mm -hmm. right. okay. um, uh, so I, I'll entertain a motion to approve, and then we can have a discussion if people. Second. So moved. You want to have it? No, I just give you the most precise. Move to approve the mission statement, vision statement, and the four strategic priorities. And I'll second. Um, so we have a motion by Mr. Cardin to approve the vision statement, the mission statement, and the four strategic priorities. Second by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion? Mr. Schlickman. Uh, having gone through uh, strategic planning and this sort of thing in Lowell a couple of times, uh, I've got to say that. It was just a joy to do this here in Arlington. Uh, the uh, the group that met up at the Odyssey was just a fantastic group of people, and we learned a lot from each other, particularly particularly from the students who were participants. So the le the big lesson we have from this, and you can see some of the words that they asked for in the mission and vision statements, is that they're really smart, really thoughtful really care about the school and their siblings. I was at a table with one young man who, and I asked him, why'd you do this? Did, I want this to be better for my younger sisters at the Odyssey. It was really great. It, it, it was a wonderful experience. So we should just keep, do what we can to keep uh, our students involved in, in the decisions we're making going forward. Yeah, I just want to say that I just think it's important to explain to the community that there, there, this was a, a process that involved multiple groups in the community, district leadership, teachers, and the school committee met on uh, Tuesday of this week under uh, Ms. Morgan's leadership, uh, the curriculum committee, mm -hmm. to for, I don't know, 90 minutes or so to finalize the wording in the document. That's why the public isn't seeing a robust discussion or debate about <coughs> nouns and verbs. Um, and semicolons. And semicolons. <laughs> but we kind of, the public should know that we did that in a, at a curriculum committee meeting on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think we're at a point to vote. Ms. Morgan? The um, curriculum subcommittee recommended that we approve this as well. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who was sort of skeptical that this was doable in the time frame that was set up, um, I am, um, I love to be wrong and I'm really glad. I think that it's great that we're at a place um, where we can do this um, now. And there's, you know, such broad agreement around mm -hmm. what we're, we're voting on. So um, I'm really happy about that. Okay, I think this is a big deal. So I'm gonna do a roll call vote. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I say one more before yes. we move on from this one? Um, first, like, I want to thank all of the staff members who gave up time in the evenings. Ms. Keyes was one of them. Um, after very long days, at one point, one week, on a Monday, followed by a consecutive Tuesday, um, 
they, they gave a lot of time in order to do this work with us. And I'm very grateful for that, as well as for all of the community members who went to work and then came back home to their communities and stayed with us into the evening. Our facilitators were fantastic. Um, and thanks to Ms. Thomas, because she's the one who ended up connecting me with them. And an extra special thanks to Arlington Education Foundation, without whom we would not have been able to do such a comprehensive and inclusive process um, with so many stakeholders at the table. They really um, were incredibly supportive of this work. And I had a lot of thought partnership from members of the community in imagining what this process could look like. And without that, I don't think it would have been as successful as it was. So thank you. Okay, now we are going to do a second read and possible vote to approve the district goals for 2022-2023. Um, and my understanding is that the strategic obje objectives are the same. They've just been organized to match our um, newly approved vision and mission. Correct, with a couple of exceptions. Okay. Um, in strategic priority four, we have added um, one strategic objective on the new website because we know that we're actively working on that now um, and on the develop and piloting of a before care program and increasing and expanding access to after school and enrichment programming for families because um, those are aligned with that one. And then other than that, they've just been reordered to fit within our new strategic priorities. Discussion from the committee? Would someone like to make a motion to approve the 20 district goals? So moved. 2022 2023 district goals. Second. Motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Mr. Schlickman. Um, any discussion? Mr. Ingram. Yes. <laughs> um, all in favor? Yes. Uh, sure. <laughs> and opposed? Abstain. No. Okay, it's unanimous. Sorry. <laughs> I have a really quick question. But yeah, yeah. So I guess what will be helpful is to at some point here. Um, so we're going to want to get updates on these, the pieces of these goals, right? And probably not do it all in one, <laughs> one go. So. Um, <laughs> that just sort of keeping track of, of when we hear about those things so that we can kind of reconcile that to the, because this feels like this is the first time that we're approving a, a list of goals under the superintendent who's actually going to be held accountable for implement, like for, for, for accomplishing those goals mm -hmm. in actually quite a few years, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, we, cause we, we've been sort of off, off schedule. So I just want to make sure that we, um, you know, that, that that's part of what we hear about um, next school year as these things, you know, sort of as they happen, which I have no doubt that they will. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, are you saying she can't leave until it's all done? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the problem here, she can leave whenever she wants, right? Uh, <laughs> so like that we all, we can all go. So we have that, that keeps us all accountable to each other. Um, the next item on our agenda is science camp and um, Ms. Morgan, I assigned your name to this as the uh, chair of CIAA. Excellent. I love being assigned <laughs> as the chair of CIAA. I, it, I, I, serve, I serve in that role with, with an incredible amount of joy. Um, so uh, in Novus is a motion that we discussed at uh, CIAA. Um, I, uh, I'm getting a lot of credit for this, uh, although Mr. Thielman was the one who, who wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so we've heard a lot from families and the community around science camp. Um, and uh, I think that this motion provides the district with a framework for thinking about it um, and um, analyzing any options that there might be. Um, I hope that it's um, received in the spirit in which, if it passes, I hope that it's uh, received in the spirit uh, in which I think it's intended, which is to, um, you know, to, to, to provide some sort of way to think about this because it's really important to, um, to a lot of people. Um, and it's, you know, certainly work that the school committee can't 
engage in directly. Um, so the, the motion that we voted on at CIA and is in Novus is moved that the school committee requests the superintendent to prepare a report by the first school committee meeting in October of 2022. Uh, I believe that meeting is October 13th. Analyzing any options for the district to offer or partner to offer an educational overnight experience to students in their fifth or sixth grade year. So um, I guess I will make that motion and then look for a second. I'll second the motion. Motion by Ms. Morgan, second by uh, Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Mrs. Thielman? Okay, Mr. Carter. So, yeah, so I, I, well, I just want to maybe Dr. Homer can just speak a little bit of the process the district leadership is going to go through between now and October so the public is aware some of the thinking research conversations will take place. Sure. So, um, I actually might defer a little bit. Okay. Or you, Dr. You Dr. McNeil, yeah, because sure. I think you okay. think about it. Right. So, um, I think we've, we've collected data and we've had a survey. Um, we've done some work already on this. And uh, I think what we're going to do is just continue on. So some of the things, so let me just say an example of that. We've gone out to nature's classroom, myself, our uh, science coach uh, for elementary, our elementary science coach, uh, the science coordinator, um, and uh, Dr. Hoyo, the director of uh, K-12 science. And we, that was last year around this time. We went out there, we did a field trip. And we talked to the person who manages that venue and we talked about our concerns, the different things that they could offer. Um, and then we came back and then we also, uh, Dr. Hoyo has recruited a couple of teachers from the high school uh, who uh, are biology and environmental science. And so we're thinking about, we were thinking about like, what does this look like from a, like a scientist perspective? So that is, some of the work that we've already done, looking at the data, looking at the students who are able to go, the students who cannot go, looking at the liability that's in, included, all those things will go into consideration as we move forward. And we'll start you know, back uh, this summer and in the early fall with the teachers that were part of, that, recruited, that were recruited from the high school, working with our science coordinator at the, at the elementary level, uh, who was the coordinator for the camp uh, trip. And then we'll get together and we'll uh, continue that process. And then we'll present something to Dr. Holman. She'll give her feedback and then we'll come to the uh, school committee and the community at large. But we also wanna also, I skipped ahead a little bit. I also want to have a parent forum. I wanna let the parents know that we hear them. I, I receive one or two emails a day about science camp mm -hmm. uh, starting a couple of months ago. So I, and I've definitely spoken to a parent on the phone. I definitely understand how passionate they are about uh, continuing this experience for our fifth grade students. But we have to make sure that it's equitable, that it's accessible to all students, and then all the other things that go into supporting students who need supports um, in order to be able to participate in experience like this. Another example is making sure like, you know, the nurse that's on duty, medication. I mean, all the things that I think that parents see that their ch children are having a very, you know, it's a fun experience. I've been up there myself. I understand the experience. And so those are the things we're going to take into consideration as we move forward. And I just want to let everyone know that we hear you. Um, and then we're going to do our best to look at this and, and provide the best experience possible for our students. Yeah, the only thing I would add, thank you, Dr. McNeil. That's, that's helpful. I think it's good for the community to, to hear that. Um, you know, the thing to be aware of is that, that there is a lot of parental support that would that would support and get involved in, in, mm -hmm. in whatever options. Um, oh, I know that. Yeah, so I think it's something <laughs> that just- That, that is yeah. not lost the, the, on me. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 pro, the program is lar was largely parent run for over the past three decades. So it's, there's, people know how to do it. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so I want to address whatever parents are still listening um, because we have had a lot of activity and emails about it. Um, I mean, I think when we had uh, Alan Jones and a longstanding summer program, the inertia was kind of behind the program to continue it, even though there were issues with the program. 
And unfortunately, the issues were not publicly discussed. They were a little bit swept, in, swept under the rug. But, but the primary issues are you know, of non-participation, kids who couldn't or wouldn't participate, of financing, and of um, you know, issues with volunteers supervising students overnight, basically. So there were, there were significant issues that weren't discussed publicly and are coming to light now um, because the inertia isn't there anymore. The program, is, Ellen Jones is gone. So the inertia now is, is we don't have a program and it's gonna take a lot of work and effort to rebuild a program. Um, and, and I see it more uh, as because of these issues, I see it more as an enrichment activity like Last Blast or some other, act, uh, other types of enrichment opportunities that are mainly driven by an outside organization in partnership with the district. And I hope that's one of the things that we'll, be, that we'll look into as long, along with some of the other suggestions that we've had, moving it to sixth grade would, would make it more equitable because those students that are left behind, it's not going to be the entire sixth grade that's going to go at the same time. We will have portions of the sixth grade go, and it won't be two or three students left behind at the school. So there are different ways to address some of the issues, but it's not easy. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be done by October. Um, but I do hope that by October, we'll at least start to have the conversation, get some options to move forward. Um, and, and see where we can go with it. Thank you. But I would, again, I would encourage those parents who are out there um, to continue to be involved, to start organizing themselves um, to support whatever, uh, whatever options get, get identified. Thanks. So we had a motion by Ms. Morgan, second by Mr. Thielman um, to request the superintendent to repair prepare a report uh, by the first school committee meeting in October, analyzing any options for the district to offer or partner to offer an educational overnight experience to students in their fifth or sixth grade year. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. Opposed? It's unanimous, the motion passes. We have financial reports from Mr. Mason. Good evening, school committee members. <clears throat> um, there's a couple of documents for your review um, that are not the normal financial reports. Um, you will see um, that included <clears throat> in Novus, and as well as I sent you via uh, email, is um, the before school pilot, uh, pilot budget draft, as well as um, fiscal 23 tuition and fees, um, as well as the fiscal 23 updated budget by budget transfer categories, and um, as well as a current year fiscal 22 uh, year-to-date spending by budget transfer categories that, that include encumbrances and actually a, a projection as well. Um, I'll start off with the last one that I just mentioned, which uh, is the fiscal 22 year to date spending by budget transfer category for uh, both um, let's pull it up for for um, the town appropriated funds. Uh, these uh, represent the spending as of uh, June 21st, uh, 2022 um, for the actuals and encumbrances. And the projections are um, we have at this point. Uh, released all payroll encumbrances due to uh, the pre preparation for the closing of the financial year. So all our projected summer uh, salaries uh, costs are in the projected column, along with other projected spending that was known at the time. Um, there are some additional costs that are going to happen. So that remaining projected balance does not necessarily reflect our <coughs> year balance. Um, what you'll notice also is a motion that is um, recommended uh, for you. I'm, I'm recommending you could approve uh, based on the variances from what we spent actually in the budget compared uh, to the budget that was approved by the school committee last year for fiscal 22. Um, and what you'll notice is that, and as I've been discussing in the monthly reports for quite some time, is that the special education. Um, uh, budget does have a remaining balance. And that was mainly driven uh, due to out of district tuition, uh, as well as 
unfilled positions uh, and other uh, dollars that were not spent in that category. And that those funds were mainly going to offset the, the spending in, in other areas where there are deficits. And it's notable to note that um, the other category, uh, we have an a substantial increase because of uh, $800,000 increase in utilities of electricity, which is um, mainly tied to a largely portion tied to the new high school phase one uh, wing, uh, which we took over uh, at the start of the calendar year or near towards that. And um, with that, we had a quick uh, turnover of the building with uh, us taking occupancy. And normally in the construction projects, they would flush out the ventilation equipment systems. And those systems were being flushed for multiple months after occup occupying the building. And we were getting charged at a, a rate that was over 200% our contracted rate um, from our electric, from usually our electric supply vendor. Um, and that's because the new phase building was not part of the original procured contract. Um, also in, included in that is about $400,000 tied to HVAC supplies and once again, HVAC contracted services. Um, so one of our commitments during, uh, you know, to prevent uh, spread of COVID-19 in our buildings, which was to install uh, higher, higher standard filters that required more frequent changes our turn, uh, uh, mm -hmm. changes of the, the, the filters. I'm sorry, I can't get the words out, but, um, but as well as we had to use a contract of services to either repair equipment or provide those like uh, uh, changes to those filters um, because we are, we're actually short staffed in the facilities department um, and we're trying to rectify those issues there. Um, others is tied to just spending um, in terms of in either in increased instructional materials or, um, or other direct related spending to the instruction at the elementary and uh, district wide level for curriculum instruction. Um, I'll stop there if you want to, do you want me to stop or continue to go for it through the documents? Uh, why don't we stop? So I move that the school committee approve the budget transfers as set forth in the document of Novus, there's six budget transfers. Second. Discussion? No, I just, did you wanna say anything? Okay, there is no discussion. Um, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So the next uh, document that will be discussed would be um, this fiscal 23 updated budget document. So you'll see that that document includes uh, the top chart uh, is the uh, budget transfer categories based on all funds. And then the bottom chart is based on the town appropriated funds, um, which is the ones that we include in our monthly reports. Um, and so what this, this, these two budgets reflect, you'll see the, the original approved budget amounts is in the first, uh, the first column under SC approved for fiscal 23. And then we have the updated uh, amounts, um, which all of these changes ref will reflect, um, you know, the rat all the ratified contracts as of today and any projected contracts that we, are con we, that we do need to bargain still. Um, as well as um, the adjustments to what we're expecting to spend if we cannot uh, um, handle all of the, the ventilation issues or the ventilation hiring and electrician hiring that we need for the facilities department. Um, so we did do some adjustments to those budgets um, as well as adjust some of the uh, out of district spending. We did see some outplacement that happened after we created the budget. Um, this led to uh, how we pulled this off in, in order to balance the budget was looking at the, 
department budgets throughout the district, including the facilities budget, and having to uh, reduce what was requested from departments, not necessarily reduce them to what their amounts were below last year, but what they requested. And um, as well as, um, also, I'm sorry, it also includes the increase of um, FTEs for uh, director level positions. I'm trying to think if there's any other things to note to that, but I don't think there's any, I, I would leave up to the school committee. Uh, obviously there's no motion here for mm -hmm. you guys to make unless you wanted to make one motion, but uh, this is more for your information. I can move on to the next document mm -hmm. if you're ready. Um, so the next document is the fee schedule um, and the actually before, I guess before we talk about the fee schedule, I guess I would hand it over to Dr. Holman to talk about the uh, before school care mm -hmm. pilot program. So we are looking at um, coordinating a pilot program for some before school care. It would start at seven o'clock in the morning and go until eight o'clock. The daily fee for families would be $15. They would need to sign up ahead of time and let us know when they were intending on coming and pay ahead of time. Um, and that would allow us to make sure that we are staffing appropriately and that we have a sense of what our enrollment will be um, on any given day. We would have a lead individual, sort of a lead teacher at each program, and we would have a support person at each program. Um, the lead, we would add another one if we went above 30. We don't anticipate that based on the feedback we've received from the community, and we wouldn't start there. We would um, start with a cap of 30 and have support people available to support that lead. And if we went above 15 students, we would add an additional support person. Right now we're looking at Pierce and Thompson um, for before school pilots, because that's where the highest level of demand was in the community. We know that there are sufficient individuals who would want to do this and would participate in order to help us get a sense of how the financials shake out in the first half of the year. And then we would be willing to assess at about the midway point of next year, whether or not we can expand it to some additional um, schools in the community. These would be housed in the cafeterias at each school. Um, there is a line in there for some additional custodial support because they would need to open up the school a little bit sooner. Um, and the uh, financial breakdown is there in your materials. I don't know if you want to add anything. I think you explained it very well. Uh, besides just the one line at the bottom, which I'll talk about in the fee schedules, which is uh, my school books is a software that um, will be rolled into a lot of our, our revolving and special program budgets. Um, when we're collecting fees, instead of tacking on a fee at checkout, it actually be built into the fee. And it'll be a software that we already use on the um, for our lunch program. And we're gonna expand the use for collection for our just student activities and special programs. Um, we've seen um, a lot of principals and uh, the classes that, and that the high school have requested ways to collect funds digitally versus physically collecting funds. And so my school bucks would be the solution that we would be moving towards for all those options opportunities and it would also help with efficiencies of billing and collecting in the business office as well um so that's what's shown there yes Mr. Hainer. the rental fees is that per hour for the gymnasiums and at, uh, yeah so per no, hour no so the so every fee it was i haven't got to the I, i'll move over to the tuition and fees mm -hmm. and so all the fees that are reflected there are actually based on three hours. Three hours. Yes. A three that, hour that covers rate. salaries and maintenance? That's just the rental of the facilities. Every, right. But every, I mean, we, we have to pay salaries for custodians. And so, I'm so I'm sorry. So every, you go down on this fee chart, um, every, every rental, they do get charged a custodial rate because there's a required minimum amount of hours that we have to pay based on the contract. Mm -hmm. And so there's a three hour minimum. And so that custodial rate is there. We charge a, a hundred and where I'm proposing $120. You'll see that is on the second page. Um, and as well, there's an, uh, um, for our long-term rental rates, we do charge uh, an other, other costs, which is includes utilities and administration fees, um, which is the $30 that we're asking to increase from $20, which hasn't been increased for quite some time. This question may not be to your members, but Dr. Holman. 
The athletic fees have been, what covers uniforms or safety equipment and stuff like that? Do we do that or is that left to the individual? Somebody's playing ice hockey, somebody's playing uh, football, things of that nature. So in, in the current budget, there is, um, before there's limit, I would have to touch base with John Bola to see what exactly he covers in his budget. Um, but we, we were covering some, a lot of the supplies for okay. a lot of the sports previously out of the general fund. Um, and so now with the elimination of the fees, what's going to get absorbed mostly on the general fund is the cost of the stipends to pay for coaches and some of the transportation related to um, getting to certain events. So the things I just mentioned would be left to the individual? I don't think so. I think a lot of those it might depend per sport, whether or not they're paying for things like the uniforms. Um, but the, the uniforms are covered. Mm -hmm. I know the uniforms are covered by the, by what we, have we have a schedule. Paying. They get replaced every four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. That part I do know. But Thank some you. of the other equipment like that, the extra gear or safety equipment, I'm not sure. I would have to touch base back with the athletic director. We had an issue several years ago that some of the equipment, football helmets and things of that nature were not updated on a regular basis and individuals were buying their own uh, for safety reasons and stuff. It was resolved at that time. I don't know if that may be something you might, you might want to look into. Ms. Morgan? It's inconsistent across the board. Like what yes, is yes. provided and what the, okay. and, and it, it, I think the way I see it is that the elimination of the fees is a great like right. first three steps. <laughs> and then once like the dust settles there, it, it would okay. bear an evaluation across sports because yes, if you have to buy a $90 uh, leotard to do gymnastics or a $79 suit to be a swimmer, um, then it still is a fee list. Your parents that have experienced this, you understand yes. that. But I th I'm coming yeah. need to know that the elimination of the fee may not cover everything. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Can I ask Mr. Mason for you to share the enrollment in instrumental music last year to this year? Oh, yes, I can. Uh, let me just pull it up. So, okay. I have a my school books question, but mm -hmm. go ahead. I just it's the enrollment was um, according to our one of our staff members sent over was um, last year's music instrumental music program we had 392 students mm -hmm. and now we have enrolled 589 students okay. with the elimination of fees mm -hmm. could come with additional costs which we will work out <laughs> we're very glad to have them mm -hmm. in the program um, so can you, and I think you talked about this at the budget subcommittee last night, but um, the My School Bucks fee, mm -hmm. the fees that My School Bucks charges us to as a service, is that tacked on when someone tries to pay or is we've embedded it in whatever yeah. it is there? So all of the prices that are included on this, on the fee schedule are inclusive of the My School Bucks amount. So the mm -hmm. currently, if uh, an individual wanted to pay for a, a, a activity fee this year, they have the option to go online and use invoice cloud, which is a town option. So the town has been in discussions on moving from that solution. And but that current option is when they use certain forms of payment, um, they had to pay a, a percentage fee. And um, I think only electronic checks was waived of the fee and it would get tacked on. So you would see that that fee added. So all of these fees include um, the processing fee that my school bucks would, okay. would charge. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary. Uh, is this the uh, appropriate time to move adoption of the fiscal 23 uh, tuition fee schedule? Second. Discussion? Mr. Cardin? Um, just so if everybody's watching, we're clear. So this, this we've been discussing about it for some time, discussing this for some time, but this is the official vote that will remove fees for instrumental music and athletics for the next, next fiscal year, adjust fees for the other programs, which are transportation, uh, before school, after school, after school's not on here, but before school and the minority preschool, if we have to do after school, we'll have to do that. Separately. 
but it's a we've been talking about it but this is the yeah. official vote mm -hmm. after this it can be official mm -hmm. notice can go out and people can celebrate we can celebrate mm -hmm. um i just want to um say thank you for working on the before school uh piece i know that um there are a, a number of a large number of parents in the community for whom this has been a challenge um and so I think a pilot is the right way to approach this um, as there may be some bumps and mm -hmm. things about um, enrollment and showing up and how much um, care people families might need um, but i think that this is a a really great step in um, moving forward and supporting our families on either end of of the school day okay um there's a I forget who, Mr. Motion by Mr. Cardin, second by, no. No, me. Motion by Mr. Schleckman, second by Mr. Cardin. Um, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Opposed? Okay, that motion passes unanimously. And we voted on these budget transfers too. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. All right. So I will no longer be updating you on COVID statistics, but we will keep a, we will keep a dashboard next year. I'm just not sure it will include all of the various statistics that we've been keeping track of this year, particularly pool testing, because as I've noted, I believe in previous meetings, um, we will not have the testing program in the same capacity as it is. We uh, continue to have cases in the schools, um, but they have been going down thanks to our ability to open up some windows and spend more time outside over the past several weeks. Um, which has been lovely. And it's also been wonderful to have a lot of in-person um, celebrations of the end of the school year and, and close out the year um, seeing everybody celebrate. So administrative hiring searches, I have a few quick updates for you this evening. Um, on these, we are welcoming Caitlin Moran as the new K-12 Director of History and Social Studies. That was announced last week. We have reposted for Bracket Assistant Principal and for Arlington High School Special Education Coordinator in the latter case, um, the preferred candidate did not accept our offer. Um, the Stratton Assistant Principal um, interviews will begin next week. The Audison Assistant Principal interviews, I believe are also, they're either starting this week or next week. Do you know when? Audison's next week. Audison's next week. Stratton, oh, Stratton has it. So flip no. those two. It sounds like Audison is next week. Stratton um, <laughs> is posted, but hasn't started yet. Uh, and then for K-12 Director of Fine and Performing Arts, initial interviews for that role will be next week. Um, so we are still very much in the throes of these hiring searches and looking forward to finalizing those. Um, a few additional updates. The last day of school is tomorrow, and it's been a wonderful year. It's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, um, especially when it comes to all the changing dynamics of the pandemic. But we, it has been a great year, and it has been wonderful to have everybody back fully in person. Um, I was reminded that actually in September, it was the first time we had all the kids back since March of 2020 because we had so many students who were remote. Um, so we, we set out to have fully in-person school and to close as little as possible and to keep our services as um, intact as possible. And I think we've had a successful year. We, you know, Omicron certainly threw us for quite a loop in the middle there. Um, but I'm really grateful for the team we have um, and the work that they've put in because it has resulted in a, a fun and, and good year. Uh, I will be sending a year in review update to the community tomorrow. Um, it highlights some of the things that we have accomplished this year and some of the things we're looking forward to accomplishing next year. Um, let's celebrate for a moment the wonderful people on the screen who are bracket teachers who were serving ice cream at the ice cream social this past week. Uh, there was a lot of karaoke and fun and dancing at bracket at the ice cream social, one of many celebrations we've had um, to end the year. We have two new mentoring and induction program coordinators, Dory Polizzi, who will um, oversee the mentoring and induction program for pre-K to five, and Kirsten Silverman will oversee the induction program for grades six through 12. This is a slightly adjusted model from what we've had in the past, and we're excited to have current acting teachers in the district um, overseeing the mentoring and induction program because they'll have a really good sense and pulse on what it is that teachers need from the mentor and induction program as we move forward. 
Um, these two will also plan the new teacher orientation for the fall, and we're looking forward to them bringing some ideas to the mentoring, to the induction process and the onboarding process for our new teachers and paraprofessionals. We have an admin retreat, as I mentioned earlier today, on Monday, and our um, goal is to unpack and understand our new vision, mission, and priorities, and to do a bit of work unpacking some instructional rounds that folks did on their own um, during the spring. And I have updated enrollments in your packet. I sent you an update earlier today for the enrollments, um, for the projected enrollments that had a few adjustments to sections that doesn't change the overall sections that we're projecting for next school year. We do have a couple of spots that we're watching, one at Hardy um, Kindergarten, because we've moved that down to three sections. And so we just want to keep a close eye on that. Um, one at Dallin Kindergarten, which is a little high at the moment, um, making sure we use buffer zones to keep as many students from entering that grade as we can. Um, Stratton Kindergarten is very low. So um, we're watching that and trying to sort of understand if there are enrollments that are still going to come in at some point. And I think those are the remaining sort of hotspots that we're keeping a close eye on. Discussion or question from the committee? So now we are going to take a possible vote to retain new council starting on July 1st, 2022. We talked about this um, at the subcommittee updates at the last meeting and so just wanted to have the committee have that information before we took it for a vote. So um, Mr. Garn, do you want to say anything more before? Uh, nope, we, we, as we discussed last week, um, this is a, a lawyer who used to be with uh, the firm we currently engage and left a few years ago to a different firm and now forming, forming her own firm, um, KM Education Law. So I move that the uh, superintendent is authorized to uh, engage KM Educational Law as one of the district's attorneys. Second. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Cardin, second by Ms. Morgan. Discussion? Do you want to specify what area since we have that motion? Is it necessary? It'd be good to just explain the public, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so this this is in the area of special education law um, for public for public she represents public and charter schools. Um, so she will um, uh, help our team with special education matters. And school discipline. So all school law, yeah. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? Um, discussion on school committee chat format for school year 22-23, Mr. Hainer. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to bring the attention of the committee. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the school committee chat was, uh, we did it in coffee shops and stuff. I think one of the benefits out of the school, uh, out of the pandemic was that we've had better attendance in the school committee chat and more involved. So uh, if, since I am in charge of setting it up and everything, uh, if there's no objection, I'm going to continue doing this. If there's no issue with the open meeting law, uh, I've already checked with town council and it's not a school committee uh, subcommittee and it's very informal. Our neutral purpose is to listen and not engage. So. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good, good report, Bill. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the next is our uh, the safe storage resolution. So um, I brought this to the committee. Um, as you heard from some of our public commenters, um, the Plymouth um, School District and the Newburyport School District had passed this resolution um, asking the school district and the community to um, work together to inform uh, the community members about securely stored securely storing firearms and their um, the legal responsibilities around that. Uh, so there is a piece about the superintendent um, and her staff communicating to parents and guardians about their obligations. And then there is a piece about um, the school committee and the superintendent working with local law enforcement agencies, health agencies, and nonprofit organizations to collaborate and increase efforts to inform Arlington parents and guardians of their obligations regarding secure storage of firearms in their homes. Uh, so Mr. Slickman. I very much appreciate the folks who brought this forward. 
Uh, it's always been our practice when things come before us to send it to subcommittee so we can take a look at it, talk to the people locally and come with an informed decision, uh, both in terms of whatever where uh, resolutions we might have or steps we might want to take. So in that vein, I'd like to move that we refer this to the uh, community relations subcommittee. Morgan. I'll second for discussion. Okay. You're going to make me work. Huh? I, I mean, we did a resolution on MCAS last year that didn't go to subcommittee. We did a resolution. Wasn't there one? We did the um, we did the ones that went to MASC without sending them to subcommittee. So I, I mean, we can certainly discuss sending it to the subcommittee, but I don't know that it's been a. a um, uh, that that's always been that has not been my experience as to have been the practice. If I, Madam Chair, if I may, just in response, Th this is okay. unique in that it directs the superintendent to do something. Mr. Hayner, did you want? I was, I'll go. I'll go with whatever the vote is. I think this is an important issue. Mm -hmm. I understand where Mr. Where Mr. Schultzman is coming from. Um, I'll be honest with the, uh, the committee. I'm going to call a subcommittee meeting as soon as possible uh, because I think that this is a very important issue mm -hmm. that we deal with. Mr. Cardin. Um, so I actually think it, it belongs in policies and procedures. You know, our, <laughs> our policy. No, let me let me let me yeah, let me continue. Our policy B D D D B file B D D school committee superintendent relationship. Mm -hmm. The committee will leave to the superintendent all matters of decision and administration that come within his or her scope as an executive officer and professional leader of the school system, communications with the public is part of that, yeah. right? So if we, if we want to have a policy as a district to make a communication, like we do with the land acknowledge, acknowledgement, mm -hmm. that should be a policy of the district, not a motion from our committee or, or community, community relations subcommittee. So, I mean, I, I, I respect what, what's trying to be accomplished. Um, my first question was going to be, though, was whether there was any discussion with the superintendent about whether she was willing to to undertake such a communication before this came to us. So, yes, and I also um, have been in communication with Chief Flaherty and um, Christine Bongiorno, the director of Health and Human Services, and Kayla Vodka, the um, executive director of, I'm going to get this wrong, the Arling, uh, Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition um, because my personal perspective is that the second clause of this, this resolve that the school committee and the superintendent will continue to work with local law enforcement agencies is the part that I um, feel strongly about. I think that this should be a community uh, responsibility and a community conversation. Um, so, I, we can move it to policy. I would also, I realize I'm not supposed to be making motions, but I would also be opening open to removing the first resolved clause if that was more amenable to the to the committee. Ms. Duggan, do you want to? Yeah, I, I um, if I have concern about either of the clauses, it would be that first one and just what the expectation is with regards to said communication and in and the obligation to inform parents of, of mm -hmm. secure storage of firearms and what that, I did have questions for Ms. Exton about what the expectation would be in terms of what that looks like. Um, and I don't quite have clarity on exactly what that would look like or what the expectation is of what that would look like um, at the moment. So those would be my thoughts on this. Mr. Salmon. So I, I <clears throat> you know, 100% agree with the sentiments of this. Um, I I think it would be a good thing to have the policies and procedures subcommittee meet and see if we could mm -hmm. enshrine this in policy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think that's a worth worthwhile in, because I think that'll make it stronger. <clears throat> if, if that's what people want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know, would you feel comfortable with that, Dr. Holman? I mean, because I... I, I certainly agree with the sentiments of this. I just need to think mm -hmm. through what the communication yeah. of it would so look I think like. It, I think we're going to require the district to do something, require mm -hmm. 
I think the good place for it is the policies and procedures subcommittee. And the benefit of that is that it becomes, you know, a policy that might have reports, uh, be, might require reports once a year or periodically. There's a lot of, it can be a stronger, it can be stronger than it is right now. I, I would take that as a friendly amendment. I, I really have no opinion as to which committee it should go to. In fact, I went to the chair before the meeting asked uh, which subcommittee she thought it, it would go to. And I, I went along with the suggestion at the time, but it seems that the majority of the committee now would like it to go to policies and I'm more than willing. Well, to I just want to make sure, I'm, I, I, can I ask, are you thinking, you're thinking it could be a policy, correct? Yes, I'm not thinking, saying, I'm not saying that I think it should be. Mm -hmm. I, right. I think that it, it, if we're going to do this, it, it has to be a policy. Yeah, right, okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. It should be discussed in the policy procedure yes. subcommittee. It should come out of there in mm -hmm. the form of a policy recommendation. Mm -hmm. Depending on how it's worded, you may have, we have, right, we all may have different opinions. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that, I think that's the process. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think for so, me, I don't know, I can't, I don't, I don't want to, but if there's four people on vote for this and we move on and that's fine. Good point. Yeah. Just trying to well, I guess what I'm, I, I do feel a somewhat sense of urgency around the community piece. And so I guess I'm wondering where the committee might sit with some way of working with um, Chief Flaherty, Ms. Mm -hmm. Longerno, Ms. Bodka mm -hmm. to expedite some kind of community communication mm -hmm. while this moves through mm -hmm. um, our process. Mr. Hamer. And I'll ask the committee to correct me if I'm wrong, but can't the superintendent meet with these people and come up with a Mm. A townwide recommendation to the community. Mm -hmm. Well, she can, but I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the need is to communicate with parents for safety of the mm -hmm. children and the community as a, as a whole. So, whatever way works, uh, I'm for it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But I understand procedural things that are brought forward. But to me, what you're just saying, I'm sure you're already considering things at this point mm -hmm. going down the path. Ms. Morgan, Ms. Morgan. There was a, what I thought, and again, not being an expert on this, I thought Chief Flaherty and Ms. Bundrina wrote an excellent memo on this topic already. Um, and I don't know if uh, there is some uh, communication that the superintendent potentially has planned over the next you know, as we're going into the summer, we don't have kids in school, mm -hmm. you know, it, is there an opportunity as, you know, people want to think about this, is there an opportunity to share that um, more broadly? Because I, I happen to read it because I go digging around on, you know, town websites, um, but most families, um, most families don't. Um, so that was something that, um, feels like it has been sort of, you know, has been addressed at the town level and, and I think speaks to the intent of this motion, whether it's as directive as it is, that would be something that, um, you know, could be considered as, you know, being shared out somehow um, with families. I, you know, I think the intent here is that um, the superintendent has you know, has access to distribution lists via email that nobody else does, right? And so um, that's um, that that's one option it, that seems to me that could be used um, in the interim to increase awareness and to um, demonstrate partnership with the police and, and, and the, the town, so. Yeah, and, and my understanding was that the document was created, but has not been sort of publicly officially disseminated. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see that, whether that's my role as chair to, to do that work um, for community relations, but that I would like to see that document get put out um, into the community. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's take the vote on referring this to policy, oh, to policy. procedures. Um, those in favor? Uh, yes. yes. Opposed? Okay, so we will refer this um, this resolution to policies and procedures. 
Um, and I will, I will work with mm -hmm. Dr. Holman and Chief Flaherty and mm -hmm. Ms. Bongiorno and Ms. Vodka to put mm -hmm. that um, document out more mm -hmm. broadly so they can see that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all. Um, so we have some policies for a first read. So Mr. Schlickman, I'll Okay, uh, so po uh, we've taken a look this first batch, the first couple of policies that we have here deal with EBC supplemental, which is the set of general interim policies on COVID related issues. We adopted this policy in the beginning of the pandemic, which gave the superintendent a bunch of powers to do things that are, that are different than the normal policies. They were very much pandemic specific things like waiving phys ed requirements because we weren't bringing kids into the gym. Um, but uh, it, it's time to make this policy go away. So it is a recommendation of the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee that the school committee uh, delete policy EBC supplemental. And that is the first read for this, to delete EBC supplemental. And in this particular policy, we would want this to be deleted before the first day of school because it has an impact on the school year. So it, the, so we, I'm assuming we're gonna have a, a meeting at some point over the summer. Uh, if not, we need to do this uh, to suspend the rules and adopt the removal. Uh, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, that question at this point, but uh, that's where we are with EBC supplemental. So it is now presented for first read to delete that policy. Is there any discussion from the committee? We don't, we don't have plans per se for a meeting. We can certainly do that. Is our, Mr. Hainer? We can, we have the option if the committee wants to see suspend the right. rule and mm -hmm. do a second read immediately tonight. Right. tonight. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, so uh, yeah. if people are open to yeah. are, are you moving to suspend the rules? Move to suspend the rules. Uh, okay, I second that. Discussion? How many rules are we suspending? I know, we're, <laughs> we're suspending. <laughs> we're we're going to suspend the rule on second read. We're on second read, okay. yeah. Just, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm no, pretty I much appreciate that. I'm pretty nervous <laughs> by expanding because I get corrected, which I, that's why I left it open. Appreciate the question. The, okay. this, it, we're suspending the rules to adopt the recommendation of deleting policy EBC, uh, uh, EBC after, supplemental. After a first read. Uh, th 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 would we, this would be our second read and we'd be adopting it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. All right, would someone okay. like to move approval? The second one is JLCB, which is a- Sorry, wait, oh, Mr. Oh, Jackson, oh move approval? Wanna, wanna, I thought, okay, so- We are suspended the rule. Okay. Move to approve uh, EB, uh, the, uh, with a deletion of EBC supplemental. Second. Motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hainer to delete file EBC supplemental. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, now we get down to JLCB. The question that we had in subcommittee, which we could not answer uh, for the full committee, it, it really deals with the uh, vaccina vaccination requirement for participation in uh, school-sponsored sports and rostered extracurricular activities. If we wish to retain that policy, uh, we'd have to put it somewhere because we have now eliminated the carrier where it sat before because that was an EBC supplemental. So if we want for there to be a vaccination policy, we would need to adopt language here for that purpose. Now, the subcommittee had a difference of opinion on whether or not we should have this remain or not. So that was the subject of discussion. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey uh, definitely wanted to retain it. And I think, I, I won't speak, speak for Mr. Heener, but I'm open to uh, letting that go with EBC supplemental. Uh, and the superintendent 
has talked to the health people and has something to say on the issue. I'm going to yeah, I did connect with Ms. Bongiorno. I have not had time to um, extensively connect with her. We haven't gotten to have a conversation. We've been back and forth via email a little bit. Um, and she has indicated that she doesn't see direct benefit to maintaining the vaccination requirement um, and that she would support elimination of that requirement mm -hmm. and um, doesn't think that there are there is significant evidence that it makes a difference when it comes to the spread or potential infection of students to have this requirement in place, in part because vaccination has become not necessarily um, a, a protector from getting infected. So, Johanna. Is this a factor in our team's plan of account? If you consider the fact that other towns may not have the same vaccination rates that Arlington does, and that if that they may potentially be more contagious, therefore, if they were to, if another student who wasn't vaccinated were to get infected, they may be more contagious. I'm um, sorry, I wasn't and clear. Likely to infect is there any students, but is there any reason that they may have something in place that would prevent our teams from playing? No. No. Okay. Thank you. That was my concern. Belmont's the only other town that has. Okay. This policy. Hmm. I was hearing this and hearing Dr. Uh, Homer connecting with Dr., uh, Ms. Bongiorno. I'll go with Mr. Uh, Schlickman and support removing it. So this is so also a first read. Mr. Yeah. So for first read, we could we could just leave this out here as first read and not take it to second read, or we could vote to. Uh, vote to not advance it to second read. So those are the two options we have. Uh, Dr. Holman. I do. I had an interaction with Ms. Allison, or Dr. Allison Ampey, um, hmm. sep uh, separately, and I know she had some concerns about us eliminating this policy. Hmm. One of the things that she had requested that I haven't been able to connect with Ms. Bongiorno on acquiring is a memo from her or some additional explanation from her as to why this isn't necess hmm. necessarily necessary. And so some time to acquire that hmm. and to get a little more detail from her, I imagine would be appreciated. Then, 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 then it would be reasonable to do nothing at this point. Can I, so, my just in terms of the, pro, the timeline here, do, do we need a vote? Do we just prior to the start of school in September? Don't we? If we wanted to have a requirement in place at the start of the school year, yes. Requirement. We wanted to, okay. But, but, but we just, I mean, we just killed EBC, right? right. Yes. So yeah. there yeah. is at present there no, is no requirement, requirement right. in That's place right. as of mm -hmm. then. So we would have to decide that we are going to bring this up again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had it. Yeah. yeah so Did wanna, we want to. I'm making no motion. So that if There's nobody else does, okay. it, 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 we've had first read and we can bring it back if, if we so choose. All right. I mean, th this, this is tricky. Um, uh, uh, next up is policy FF-E, procedures for naming new spaces at Arlington High School. This came at the request of the superintendent who's looking at the new spaces and we worked with her sent, uh, to craft uh, uh, a policy or a procedure for dealing with the spaces at the high school. So Again, this is for first read. And just as a little bit of clarity, this would only be for the process of naming new spaces at this high school while this project is underway, mm -hmm. not something that would be ongoing beyond the scope of this project mm -hmm. once it's completed. Mm -hmm. And that's for first read. And the following one is ACAB. Uh, oh, I'm I sorry. I think there's a comment. Yeah, Ms. Morgan. So this is just for the, it's the, 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 the the, the wording here doesn't work. So charge of the plan, the advisory panel on naming and memorials at Arlington High School recommendations, I assume make rec will make recommendations for the seven major name spaces. So this is just for those seven. Mm -hmm. Is it pot, like, could, I, I guess in, in the second read of this, could we get the list of those seven spaces so that when people ask us about it, we can be like, they're right here. These are the ones that are, that fall under this. That would be helpful. There are seven committee members too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Cardin. Yeah, it, just another edit. I mean, it says in order to name common spaces in new and existing buildings, the superintendent will convene an advisory panel. So it sounds like this is actually for both new and existing. Buildings. Yeah, that new part needs to come out, I think. Missed it. Yeah, we've done a few edits to make this high school specific, and we may not have caught them. Okay. The intent, it, yeah. the intent's very clear that this is only for the high school. <coughs> okay, and it's this, we can. We, we can edit it uh, before it. second read, yeah. Okay. And, but we don't need to bring this back. No, this is, this, okay. this is not urgent. Uh, we don't need to pass it uh, until our next regularly scheduled meeting. The other one, are, are, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. Yep. The other one is ACAB. If you recall, there was a package of sexual harassment uh, and you know student right policies that MASC recommended to us, and we passed most of those, but we didn't do ACAB because we were not happy with the grammar and wording, and so we went and fixed that, and now have that before us for first read. This is one that I would recommend just getting into the policy books now uh, because it is part of the rest of the package. It is just the matter of aligning to current federal and state law, and we've adopted the rest of the package. So I'm going to first move to suspend the rules so that we may advance this to second read. Second. Any discussion about suspending the rules? Vote to suspend the rules. All in favor? Aye. Yes, opposed? It's unanimous. Move adoption of ACAB um, replacing the current policy. Second. I have a quick question. Yep, that's part of the discussion. This, this is the one, Dr. McNeil, this is the one that you worked on. Is that right? The sexual harassment one? I feel like, because we did all these, I'm trying to like put this in the framework of my memory of when mm. we dealt with these, or did we like, this would Where no. This was, was this. this. This came from MASC, and we, we did, did the okay. other the other batch a couple of months ago. Help me. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking the restraint. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. it was updated the yeah. restraint Thank policy. Yes. Okay, good. I'm I'm here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> a motion by Mr. Slickman, second by Mr. Hayner, um, to approve to file ACAB sexual harassment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Sentences. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22283 dated June 14th, 2022, in the amount of $682,708.95, approval of school committee regular meeting minutes, June 9th, 2022. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Hayner, second by Ms. Morgan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous, the consent agenda passed. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Um, Budget, Dr. Alcanampi is not here. Mr. Cardin, do you wanna? Sure, I can fill in. I, um, so we had a meeting yesterday where we basically discussed the items that we went over and approved um, this evening. I think that was it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, community relations, Mr. Hayner. Nothing to report. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. We met this last week mm -hmm. and went over the um, vision and mission uh, that were approved tonight and talked very briefly about science and math. Facilities, Mr. Thielman? No report. Policy and procedures, Mr. Schlickman? We met on the 15th uh, and for, for the purpose of making proposals we had tonight. Uh, the draft minutes are, in, uh, are, are before you. High school build, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. It's moving along. We're doing great. We had a vote. We had a meeting the other night um, <clears throat> to um, finance the uh, moving of uh, the uh, photovoltaic, photo, photo, the panels, the solar panels <laughs> to the new building. And uh, so things are moving along on, on schedule. I don't know. Anything else that I should speak to? 
They're pile driving outside our <laughs> office <laughs> and everything shakes <laughs> all day long. <laughs> there have been some administrative complaints. About <laughs> we're, and, uh, we're getting through it. And the, committee, okay. the committee has a process to hear those complaints and we're concerned. She had several hot hi hat guys up there the other day checking it out. They looked out the window and they said, yeah, it's doing what it's supposed to. It, it is worst for us. I, I, we were a little worried about the kids taking their finals right next to some of those windows, but it, it shakes more on the sixth floor because we're at the top and, and, and you're a little more insulated in the classrooms where the kids are. So they get they get the thunk, we get the thunk and the shake. So I just hope it doesn't advance the uh, demolition schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh. liaison reports. Announcements, Mr. Hainer. Since this is the last meeting of the year, I'd like to thank Dr. Holman, the administrative uh, cabinet for a phenomenal job. In any year, it would have been a tough year. This year it was 10 times as tough, so thank you all. I would like to also add special thanks to Ms. Diggins for putting up with all of us, especially me this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll throw in a thank you to the teachers for the AEA for getting us through this this mm -hmm. year with uh, all the ups and downs and, and we made it almost. <laughs> One more day. One more day. One more day. Future agenda items. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And you're 19 minutes early. Uh,